And now I'd like to introduce Dean Tony Bernardo, Dean and Anderson Chair in Management uh, from University of California, uh, Anderson School of Business, who will be moderating our next session on how Kite is building a global car T franchise out of LA. Dr. Bernardo. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here today with a few members of the Kite leadership team uh, to discuss how their company with deep roots in LA is continuing to expand and shape the Los Angeles biopharma ecosystem. As you may know, Kite is a cell therapy company with a CAR-T franchise. CAR-T cell therapy is a transformative one-time therapy for certain types of blood cancers that uses a patient's own immune system to fight their cancer. We're joined today by Mert Akhtar, Kite's head of corporate development, Francesco Marincola, Kite's global head of cell therapy research, Frank Newman, Kite's global head of clinical development, and Matt Hostetler, Kite's head of human resources. Thank you all for joining us. Mert, uh, perhaps uh, you could get us start us uh, started. Uh, please tell us about the company's top priority and focus right now. Hi, Antonio, and thanks for the question. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I, I think just to um, put some context, uh, Kite has emerged as a pioneer in autologous cell therapy for hematologic malignancies and we continue to lead uh, with our core CAR-T business in lymphoma and leukemia. Uh, KITE has the longest term uh, clinical trial data in uh, diffused large B-cell uh, lymphoma with 44% of Yescarta treated patients uh, from the Zuma-1 trial still alive at four years. And we've also treated over 4,500 patients in both clinical and commercial settings. Uh, with all that said, you know, however impressive that sounds, uh, yet much remains to be done to realize the full potential of cell therapy, where only four out of 10 uh, third line plus uh, DLBCL patients in the US in non-ATC you know, uh, treatment center practices are referred for cell therapy, and only two of those people actually receive cell therapy. And globally, very few patients have access to cell therapy. So therefore, our singular focus is to ensure that more patients have the potential to benefit you know, from CAR-T cell therapy. And along those lines, we continue to make significant progress on this journey across multiple dimensions. You know, we are growing our CD19 franchise horizontally across indications, vertically into earlier lines of treatment, and also geographically into new markets beyond just the United States and Europe. And within this context, we are committed to deliver the best-in-class products to patients and advance the frontier of cell therapy to reach more patients. And organizationally, this translates to really three strategic priorities for us. And first and foremost, you're looking to bring Yescarta and Tecardis to more lymphoma and leukemia patients. And secondly, we are working to develop next generation CD19 treatments in lymphoma and leukemia, including uh, exploration of allogeneic and dual targeting modalities. And finally, we are looking to advance cell therapy selectively into new targets for heme malignancies and ultimately uh, into solid tumors. And within that context, LA really offers us key opportunities to execute on the strategy with strong institutions focused on cancer and biotechs to build partnerships, and also a unique population to help diversify research and clinical trials, as well as a rich talent pool to advance our you know, robust pipeline. Thanks, thanks, Mert. Frank, um, glad you're here. Uh, glad you could be with us today. I know Kite has uh, had a few recent and upcoming FDA milestones. Can you tell us a little bit about that and uh, how you see the future of CAR T cell therapy evolving? Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. This is, uh, this is a great opportunity and I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Yes, uh, we had a couple of milestones and, and we will have more. And, um, you know, uh, to say the least, um, I've worked in different um, cell therapy companies and uh, Kite and the uh, LA position, if you wish, is, is uh, perfectly suited to do so. So one milestone uh, was just uh, this past uh, March. And, um, you know, we had uh, an Escarta approval. This is one of our CD19 CAR T's in patients who are suffering from relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma. That was for after two or more lines of systemic therapy. And, and you know, it's always great 
uh, to see another opportunity emerging for patients at need. But um, uh, this trial, the Zuma 5 trial, um, you know, I think this goes back to Ari Baldwin that all of the trials are called Zuma. Uh, it took a while for an East Coast person from Europe to figure out that's actually a beach in LA, I think, or in that vicinity. Um, so it, it, it showed tremendous results. Um, uh, second, if, if, if you're asking for the upcoming milestones, one thing with which we, um, and I'm not saying that because I'm at Kai, I truly mean it, potentially right history is in, in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. That's the Zuma 7 trial, um, where we're actually in second line competing against standard of care, which currently is autologous stem cell transplantation. And depending on the data, uh, it took a while. Uh, if I say to, to that, that, that we can write again history because 1995, it was actually Bruce Chesson who brought other transplant into um, the field and, and a, a blessing for the patient. If we are better, which I hope, then that's, that's absolutely, um, you know, it's an understatement to say um, it's a milestone. Um, we, have, we have other uh, things on our way in different indications. The second um, product we are having targeting CD19 is Tacardis, and that one is under review with the FDA for relapsed refractory ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Very confusing. It's a leukemia, but it's still a lymphoma. And, um, you know, what, what should be underemphasized, and that is an overarching milestone and, and uh, uh, um, Murd alluded to that is, you know, uh, in our approved setting, um, we still are, you know, I would say shining with, you know, as Murd said, 44% of the patients still to be alive after four years. Um, and, um, you know, um, as I said, uh, numerous milestones behind us, a couple, uh, well, a couple is understated, numerous in front of us, and, and um, you know, as Murray alluded to, we hope to make a huge impact uh, on patients uh, with a variety of uh, indications, lymphoma in particular, leukemia, um, but also solid tumor. So these are the milestones that are upcoming. Thanks, Frank. That, that's very exciting. Um, uh, Francesco, uh, thanks also for joining us. Um, Kite is a company that's committed to transforming uh, cancer treatment by pursuing therapies that are uh, with, with curative intent. Uh, can you uh, help us understand the thinking behind that and the vision that's driving you and uh, Kite researchers forward? Yes, absolutely, and thanks for having me. Um, well, I'm gonna try to summarize a lot of aspects that can be improved, of course. But uh, overall, the priority is to expand the treatment so more patients can benefit from CAR therapy. In fact, only three out of 10 potentially eligible patients in the US at this point have this access. And uh, globally, most patients don't have access. And that's something that has to be improved because these are potentially curative uh, approaches. How can that be done? Well, for example, you can streamline manufacturing and distribution processes with scientific uh, su support. And again, adopt, adopt new approaches to, ex, approaches to expedite the expansion of cells. Enhancing the functional profile, a constant norm is, consider, is uh, referred to as fitness, improve the quality of the cells, in other words. Um, this may re require adaptation, adoption of new technologies that uh, modulate the level of differentiation and metabolic status of the cell. Uh, another important approach is the adopting revolu revolutionary gene delivering approaches that can be uh, gradually applied and there can improve efficacy, safety, and decrease production costs. Um, so these are all, and of course, toxicity, mitigating toxicity. There is no science behind that. And so these are, of course, these are the primary interest at this point uh, through internal cross-functional collaboration as well as external partnerships. Another priority is, is to increase the efficacy because about only 40% of patients treated benefit from long-term term dual responses. And so how can that be done? Well, by using extrinsic, what we call extrinsic or intrinsic enhancers that can improve the persistence of the infused cells, their traffic, trafficking to the two target organs in some cases, and then, most important, their ability to overcome the challenges they encounter upon engagement with cancer cells in an hostile microenvironment. And this holistic approach, and you have to tackle most of them at the same time if you want to succeed. 
So this holistic approach can probably be better on tackle with new technologies like new platforms, like synthetic biology. So you create intelligent cells beyond the uh, normal behavior of, of naturally occurring T cells that can respond to contextual challenge, challenges in the tumor microenvironment with extreme specificity, restricting at the same time unnecessary and potential toxic function. So to summarize, in the short term, what are we working on uh, to improve efficacy? Well, we are looking into uh, uh, adopting uh, 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 a bisistronic or dual targeting that would uh, increase the uh, the patient, um, uh, you know, eligibility as well as prevent, hopefully, uh, escape mechanism by loss of the target ant antigens. At the same time, we're tackling other diseases like AML, um, uh, AML uh, which can uh, as is a model system that could be very uh, comparable to the um, B cell lymphoma. And, uh, at this, and uh, very um, importantly, we're going to try to uh, re, um, match the potential, the, uh, the potential technology and enhance T cells with the real um, life uh, challenges that we're learning from our, and as well external uh, bedside to bench correlative studies, where we know what the real problems are to, uh, to overcome. Finally, we're, uh, I think like anybody else, we're interested in alternative cell products or other emerging technologies uh, in their proof of concept phase. And of course, partner uh, as much as we can with the whatever academia or industry, whatever it is. So I don't know if I summarize, it's a complicated story, but <laughs> I think pretty much that's our thinking. Thank, thanks, Francesco. There's clearly a lot of exciting opportunities at Kite Matt, thanks for joining us. There are, I, I'm sure, many undergrads, graduate students, postdocs here on this call who are interested in perhaps career opportunities to be part of the excitement at, at Kite. Can you tell us the kinds of opportunities that are available uh, currently, uh, particularly for uh, some of our, our students who might be in the audience? Sure, and then thanks for having me on the panel and thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, plug career opportunities at Kite. So, uh, you know, just over half of our 2,600 employees are based here in LA. Uh, we've got our corporate headquarters and some uh, clinical labs and, and, and clinical manufacturing right here in Santa Monica. Uh, we have a manufacturing plant in El Segundo. And really, um, our technical operations team, um, that's the group that comprises process development, uh, manufacturing, quality, supply chain, um, is one of our fastest growing areas. Um, we're really gearing up for, you know, expansion with, uh, you know, getting into new lines of therapy, launching in new countries. Um, we've already got 220 uh, partnerships with uh, cancer centers uh, that are authorized to treat patients. Um, and it's, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to get some career opportunity or career experience, um, you know, in one of the, the leading uh, cell therapy companies in the world. You know, our, our manufacturing process is uh, one of the fastest at 16 to 17 days. And uh, we've got a manufacturing success rate of about 96%, which is um, incredible. Um, you know, and of course, if, if tech ops isn't your, your, your thing, we also have opportunities in, uh, you know, research and development and all of our business functions like, uh, you know, Mert's team with corporate affairs, finance, IT, HR, uh, you name it. So there's a lot of exciting opportunities here in LA. And, you know, if you've got friends who don't live in LA, we've also got some growth opportunities in the Bay Area, uh, the DC area, and uh, also Southern, other parts of Southern California and Oceanside. Thanks, Matt. Uh, several of you have mentioned um, the importance of the uh, ties between industry and, and academia. Uh, Kite is a, a real, uh, a really tremendous LA success story. Can you uh, tell us, Mert, a little about how industry and academia can work together to create more companies like Kite in LA? Yeah, absolutely, Antonio. I think it's a great question. Um, I think in terms of uh, the context, I uh, personally think that Kite is a great example of what we would term as an innovation-driven enterprise in whose competitive advantage and growth potential was driven by innovation itself. And in order to facilitate uh, creation and growth of innovation-driven enterprises like Kite, I think it's really crucial to nurture an innovation ecosystem 
that interconnect people, resources, and also the physical environment uh, with those people and resources. And we see many examples of such innovation ecosystems around the world. Uh, one of the most notable ones uh, in life sciences in the Candle Square, you know, Boston area, which tightly connects multiple stakeholders across entrepreneurs, risk capital, large corporations, academia, and government. And within that context, uh, LA actually has all the elements necessary for a vibrant uh, innovation ecosystem and offers a significant opportunity to start, grow, and also scale new innovation-driven enterprises through really an intentional combination of um, innovation capacity and as well as entrepreneurial capacity. And at Kite, uh, we are working with a number of partners uh, with locations in LA and Southern California in general to really push the boundaries of what is possible. And our collaborative efforts are really driving the science of cell therapy forward. Uh, we you know, fundamentally believe in the you know, power of partnerships to really leverage the best technologies, research, and as well as operational advancements for drug development, and we're pursuing you know, uh, our activities within this light. Thank you. Um... Uh, Matt, I'm going to get back to you now, if that's okay. I know um, uh, inclusion and diversity is a, a key priority for Kite. Uh, it's critically important in healthcare and clinical research. Uh, can you tell us what Kite is doing uh, on uh, IND in its own workforce and, and through its operations and partnerships? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and you know, our goal is to be the employer of choice um, in, in cell therapy. Um, for all employees, but especially for a, a, you know a diverse population of employees as well, that really reflects the uh, patients and, and the world that we serve. Um, and we've really been looking at uh, ways to increase that diversity. Um, and of course, that starts with inclusion. And one of the things I'm most proud of is is um, the feeling of belonging that we can create at Kite. We recently just did an all employee survey. And um, our inclusion score, the, the self-reported score of employees around how, how much do they feel they belong um, and respected at Kite was one of our highest rated areas um, of, of uh, top scores uh, in the entire survey. And, you know, inclusion isn't enough. We also have to take action to increase our, our overall representation. And, you know, we just published our, our annual report um, with our parent company, Gilead, and I'll just highlight a couple of things. You know, our overall population is 51% uh, female. Um, and within management, uh, it's 48% management as well. So we've got good levels of uh, gender equity um, that we're always looking to increase uh, to make it even more representative. And certainly we're, we're looking to increase our representation with uh, you know, the Black African-American population as well as uh, uh, our Latinx population. And we've got a lot of uh, great partnerships internally and externally uh, to do that. And I'm, I'm pleased with our progress, but not satisfied. Um, there's certainly a lot more work to do, especially today as we mark the, the anniversary of the killing of George Floyd. We're really taking stock of uh, you know, the progress we've made and the work that we had to do ahead. You know, the, the other stat that I'll just mention to you briefly is um, one of my favorite things about you know, our inclusion uh, work and diversity work is how engaged our employee population is in this. You know, over half of our employees are engaged in at least one of our employee resource groups or, or ERGs. These are affinity groups that support our, our business groups across you know, uh, the Black African-American population, the Latinx population, Pride, uh, the LG, LGBTQ uh, population, uh, veterans and of course women, um, and watching them all partner together to uh, increase that uh, inclusion and diversity is really something to behold and one of my favorite parts of the job. Thanks, Matt. And just uh, I wanted to remind the audience that um, you can enter questions. We'll have a little bit of time uh, towards the end to answer audio, audio uh, audience questions. So you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you want to enter them and all uh, I'll um, curate them and, and pass them on to our panelists. Um, uh, before we get to audience questions, though, I want to pick up on uh, a few themes that uh, we've heard about here. Uh, Francesco, if you if you could talk a little more about the future of CAR T and and something that's been mentioned by all the panelists, how uh, the LA area will help uh, enable uh, that future for Kite. 
if you could speak a little bit to that, um, this being uh, really a, a program that talks is talking quite a bit about the uh, the agglomeration effects uh, uh, of being part of this LA community. If you could elaborate on that, I think the uh, the audience would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, so um, thanks for. Uh... Uh, give me this conclusive remarks. So if you really want to look at uh, this way, adoptive cell therapy is really a, a dignified approach for cancer treatment that has shown potential for cure. The question is now how you can expand it to a larger patient indications, larger patient populations, and so forth. And you can do that in different ways by increase, making it easier with low approaches, alternative approaches, off-the-shelf approaches, at the same time improving indication. That's the elephant is in the room is the solid tumors. So uh, I think the, uh, the best way to see the, how that could evolve is really to think about a sky as a success story, making things happen, you know, identifying solutions and, you know, and know how. But the question sometimes is, you know, you don't want to be like the story of the laser. There's a solution uh, uh, trying to find a problem. So, uh, so the idea here is like to match within a, together with a healthy academic community around environment, have a, that critical mass to identify the problems, the real problems that are limiting the, the usefulness of CAR-Ts in, in different, particularly in solid tumors, and create this kind of ecosystem that uh, eventually would be great. And, you know. I, I get the, the virtual world in which we're living has limited a lot of uh, personal interaction, but I can wait for example to come and visit Tony Ribas. I don't know if Richard is still there, uh, Yvonne Chen. So you have a lot of people there just you know, forgetting all the other parts of uh, Los Angeles and UCLA that have contributed enormous understanding the mechanism of responsiveness. And so that's how we can really build together, match solutions with problems and find new solutions at the same time. Thanks. Thanks, Francesco. So we have a, a question from the audience, and perhaps Frank, if you want to take this, or uh, uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but you, you you spoke earlier, Frank, about the uh, coming milestones for Kite, and and this question from uh, an an, a, an attendee asks, what would be uh, the next great milestone you'd like to see come to fruition for Kite? Well. Um... I would say that there are realistic short-term ones and, and then there is um, the aspirational one. I, I would say the realistic short-term one is um, that in lymphoma um, and the indications that we're currently pursuing, we cannibalize ourselves. We find something that is even better than what we have today. Um, that we, um, you know, um, for the first time, I would say, um, find a durable and, and um, also non-toxic approach, curative approach potentially in acute myeloid leukemia, um, and that we play a significant part, um, you know, we're all in this together and nobody has solved the riddle yet for solid tumors, that we play a significant part in, um, you know, helping patients with solid tumors. Um, the more aspirational thought is, uh, but that's maybe getting also philosophical. I'm doing this since over 20 years. And um, I would say cell therapy, you know, I, I went through the small molecules and the TKIs and the antibodies and the checkpoint inhibitors. And um, it was always a hype and, and, and great achievements for patients. But um, I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, Clearly, if, if we could find that one modality in cell therapy that is very efficient, not toxic, a one-to-many approach, and, and um, uh, could be used for several indications, that would be uh, my long-term vision. My short, short, short-term vision, what keeps me up at night, literally, and, and Mert knows this because some, sometimes I call him, uh, is, um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the Zuma 7 trial, which is the second line DLBCL indication, um, you know, that would be tremendous for patients, in my view, um, if Kite could uh, play a little role in, in writing history there, that would be amazing, and, and, and we'll see that too. Thanks. Um, I have another question. Um, and you were acquired by Gilead. If one of you could talk about the difference between uh, being part of that corporate structure versus 
um, you know, the, you know, being a, an independent firm prior to that, how that's changed uh, various operations at the company, um, whether it's uh, how, how you, uh, how you make uh, project uh, decisions, how you conduct research or any other important uh, operational aspect of the company. I can I can start a little bit with that. I think I'm the the person on the panel who has the most tenure with Kite, um, and, and actually come from the mothership on the Gilead side. So, you know, I always like to think about the relationship with with Gilead as the best of both worlds. We are still a small, independent, um, you know, company that is doing cutting edge science, uh, but we have a, a rich parent company who can help us fund a lot of the really interesting stuff. Um, and we don't always have to worry about sort of where, where's our next series of funding coming from, uh, things like that. And they also certainly help us fund some, you know, phenomenal employee uh, benefits and, and provide a lot of structure, um, you know, things that I, I don't have to worry about as a, as a GNA leader, um, because there's a, a broader, you know, bigger parent who can take care of some of those, you know, payroll and other operational type, type activity that really lets us focus in on the science, the patient and, uh, you know, really evolving, uh, you know, cutting edge science. Um, you know, that, that's my perspective, but uh, welcome others as well. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit uh, more color on, you know, you had asked specifically about governance. You know, I think the term we use, you know, between the two companies is that, you know, Kite is independent, but not necessarily isolated. Um, you know, we have our own leadership team, most of whom are on this call, uh, and our own CEO. Uh, so we have a lot of independent decision making, um, you know, um, I would say authority, you know, within the scope of Kite, what Kite is focused on, setting our strategy, uh, and then communicating that you know, back to Gilead. Uh, Gilead is also making, you know, moves, big moves into oncology. And we do, you know, intend to remain as the cornerstone of innovation uh, with the curative intent that CAR T provides uh, within the broader aspect of oncology treatment. Thanks, Mert. Um, and just a final thought: if anybody would uh, uh, would like to uh, comment, you know, the the uh, uh, the the benefits that you saw early on in your life cycle. Uh, of being part of the LA ecosystem, where you see its strengths are, but also if you thought there were areas where the ecosystem really had to be strengthened to create more great companies like Kite, um, uh, your thoughts on that would be really appreciated. I don't know, Mark, maybe that's for you. Yeah, I, I can maybe I, I'm also, you know, in fairness, you know, new to the even the West Coast. Uh, so I'm a total newbie here, uh, you know, coming from the East Coast, and, you know, primarily the, the Cambridge, Boston area. Uh, but I guess it's actually a good benchmark within that context. You know, there's so much going on uh, on the East Coast. And you know, I, I have to say I was very impressed by the talent pool uh, in L.A., you know, how uh, you know, talented, uh, you know, the people at Kite, you know, are, uh, as well as, you know, the talent pool available uh, within the general area. You know, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a really, you know, um, strong, um, you know, elements of a potentially very vibrant ecosystem here. And I, I would say that if we could really harness all those elements in a very concerted way, uh, I think we could be, probably create uh, the next uh, you know, vibrant e life sciences ecosystem in the greater LA area, uh, in my opinion. I think all the elements are there and it's ripe you know, for that level of, um, you know, I guess, catalyst events you know, to come together. Because uh, you got academia, you know, you got the biotech, you got risk capital, and you have also the larger corporations in the area. That's great. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, thank you, Mert, Frank, Matt, Francesco, for joining us. This is a, a, a very terrific, illuminating uh, conversation. Congratulations on all your uh, past and future successes at Kite. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.